fine, D. Marie. <laughs> um, and I'm the programming coordinator here. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome you all to this month's Think and Drinks. Think and Drinks, for anyone who doesn't know, are a free monthly speaker series that happens on the first Thursday evening of every month. Um, this year, in celebration of the USS Cobia's 80th launch anniversary, we're hosting a year of these free talks that are in, uh, focused on interesting and often untold stories from World War II. Um, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Wisconsin Humanities Council. Wisconsin Humanities Council is one of the reasons that we're able to have these talks be free and we're able to have them every month. Um, the Wisconsin Humanities Council strengthens our democracy through cultural programs that build connections and understanding between people of all backgrounds and beliefs throughout the state. So they're really important for us. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited about tonight's talk. This is something, as I told our speaker before, I've been hoping to bring this person here for about a year and a half. So I'm really excited that it's actually happening. Um, and yeah, so we are gonna get to hear from David Davis, who's gonna be talking about his book, Wheels of Courage, How Paralyzed Veterans from World War II Invented Wheelchair Sports, Fought for Disability Rights, and Inspired a Nation. So yeah, take it away, David. All right, thank you, Caroline. Really appreciate it. And hi to everybody um, in Wisconsin. I'm sorry I couldn't make the trip out. Um, I'm here speaking in my office in Los Angeles. Um, so good to meet you um, over the computer. Uh, if you hear some dogs barking, that's just our dogs. We have two knucklehead dogs. So apologies in advance if there are any um, interruptions canine wise. Um, but I'm here really to talk about Wheels of Courage, uh, a book that came out in 2020, just in time for the pandemic. Um, so uh, I wasn't able to do any in-person tours. So I uh, have gotten used to a little bit doing the Zoom type uh, programming. So I hope uh, this runs smoothly. Um, and as Carolyn said in the introduction, this book is about um, paralyzed veterans from World War II who invented wheelchair basketball, wheelchair sports, um, and fought for disability rights, um, among other things. And so what I'd like to do is sort of take you through some of the people who I introduce in the book and who I met in the research of this book, um, both veterans, medical personnel, athletes, that sort of thing, and sort of trace it, trace the book and trace this journey through the photos of these men and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So uh, first slide, uh, please. Um, next, yeah. So I uh, introduce you to a, a gentleman named Jerry Fessenmeyer. Um, I was he, uh, among the three veterans that I focused on in the book, in the narrative, he was the only one who was still alive. And I was fortunate enough to meet him and interview him and spend a lot of time with him, both in person and on the phone. Um, and you can see this is, uh, he's a Marine. He's 17 years old in 1945. He actually got his uh, parents' permission to enlist early. Um, uh, he was an Iowa farm boy. He told me that he ran off the stage at his high school graduation to catch a bus to go to California Camp Pendleton and uh, join the Marines. He was gung ho. He was also very realistic. He said he was he was fodder. Basically, he was going to be tr he was trained for the uh, invasion of Japan, the mainland, if that had come to pass. Obviously, it didn't. Um, but he then fought in Okinawa. He was trained with the what's called the BAR, B-A-R, Browning Automatic Rifle. Um, and he was on Okinawa, which was the last major battle in the Pacific. Um, and very shortly before the war ended, he was shot um, by a, a, a Japanese soldier um, carrying a Nambu gun. And... Um, he had emergency surgery right on the beach in, uh, and, and then taken to a hospital ship right offshore, then taken to Hawaii, and then taken home, um, flown home when he was well enough. Uh, he told me he weighed about 65, 70 pounds um, when he finally reached California. 
um, and he went to uh, the ho Naval Hospital in Corona, California, which is about 50 miles uh, east of Los Angeles. And uh, he, he told me that the men in the clinic uh, who had been there a little while longer than he had, they took bets as to whether he would live or not live. And thankfully he did, and he lived to the grand old age of 90 something before he passed away. So that was one of the three men I wrote about. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, this was a, a second gentleman. Uh, that's Johnny Winterholler on the right. Um, uh, he's at the University of Wyoming, posing with his high school sweetheart and college sweetheart, uh, Dessa, that was her name. Um, and uh, he, Johnny had an amazing sort of precarious childhood. He was one of 19 children. Um, he was born in poverty, took a lot of jobs, odd jobs growing up. Um, this is during the Depression and uh, attended Wyoming uh, on ROTC scholarship. And you should know about Johnny Winterholler at Wyoming. I mean, he was among all these, the three veterans that I write a lot about here, he was probably the best athlete and, and possibly a pro major league baseball, maybe basketball, maybe football uh, potential. He was that good, natural athlete, just skilled. Uh, but of course, he had the ROTC commitment, and he went to the Marines. Uh, he was in the Philippines. He was based in the Philippines. He was there uh, in 1941, even before Pearl Harbor, um, as they were sort of preparing the Philippine Army to try to stand off with the Japanese. Uh, of course, unfortunately, that did not happen. He was captured on Corregidor, the island um, right outside of Manila. And Johnny was held in Japanese prisoner of war camps until the end of the war, until 1945, when the, the U.S. Uh, finally invaded uh, the Philippines with General MacArthur. Um, and unfortunately, because of the lack of care, medical care, nutrition uh, in these terrible, horrible POW camps, which the conditions were just horrendous. Um, he became paralyzed because of that malnutrition, um, unfortunately, and uh, it was irreversible. He probably, if, if, if he had been in a normal situation, he probably could have had a surgery and been okay. Unfortunately, he wasn't. Uh, he came back to the States. Um, he was taken to the Naval Hospital at Corona, same hospital as Jerry Fessenmeyer, and um, he was reunited with Dessa. Um, they got married very shortly after he returned. He was still in the hospital bed. Uh, they got married and um, we'll revisit him a little bit later as, as the wheelchair basketball starts. And I'll, I'll introduce you to the third gentleman. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that's Stan Denadell. Um, he was aspiring to be a, 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 like a national park ranger growing up. Born and raised in the Midwest, but uh, ended up in California, Northern California. Um, super smart, was in college at Berkeley, and uh, but the war called. He went over, fought in the Battle of the Bulge over in Europe. Um, and uh, as the Allies, the U.S. and the Allies were sort of rolling uh, past uh, uh, into Germany and Austria, um, Stan was shot in the back a week before Germany surrendered. So just a sort of heartbreaking uh, case. And, and uh, he eventually also made it back. He ended up in California as well at a different hospital at Birmingham Veterans Hospital in uh, out where I am, uh, Southern California in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys. And we'll talk a little bit more about Stan Danadel um, but the one, one aspect that all three of these young men share, well, a couple aspects. One is they're young men who have now been paralyzed. Um, and they, in the beginning, all of them were just, as whether they said this to me personally or wrote it in their diaries or wrote letters afterwards to their children, um, it was distraught. They didn't know what to do. And frankly, at that time, as, as we'll see, most people didn't know what to do. 
And uh, so ne next slide, please. Um, and, and this is where the um, book gets a little bit more into the medical side of things, taking a detour from the men themselves and talk about what it was like to uh, encounter paralyzed men, women, paraplegics at that time. So let, let's, let's see what they faced. There was no such thing, let, uh, until the mid thirties, there was no such thing as penicillin. Um, frankly, if you were a paraplegic, you were probably going to die within 18 months. And it wasn't necessarily from the wound or from the incident that occurred, it was from disease or sepsis or something that would invade infections that would be in the kidney, bladder, those type of things. And there was just no defense medically about that. Um, uh, another example of this was there were no ways of physical therapy to help pe people um, after their incident of that, that rendered them paralyzed. Um, most of them, if they were fortunate enough to survive, were put away in homes or lived. If, if, if a family was affluent, they might have, have an aid there. Um, and this is an example. What, I, what I'm showing here is an old fashioned wheelchair. And you can see the big wheels in the front. Those are metal wheels, um, hardback cane in the back. Um, these are not really maneuverable. They're not transportable. You can't just slip somebody, slip that into a car and drive around. So the fate of most paraplegics at that time was not very good. They were called dead enders. They were called no hopers. And it took, frankly, um, the medical community to come up with solutions. And uh, next, next slide, please. Um, well, this is another example of, of, of what uh, people with disability thought, uh, sought, saw back then. Um, this, of course, is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had polio at a, when he was a young man. Um, he was able to overcome that. Um, his family was super rich, but wealthy, um, could afford the best medical care and treatment. And he was okay, obviously, ran for president and won four times. But you see this photo, uh, Franklin FDR never allowed himself to be photographed like this. This is a rare photo. Uh, it's with a fr family friend at his estate in uh, Hyde Park, New York. Um, and what it points to is beyond the medical uh, inability at that time, the stigma that uh, people faced with disability. There were laws against, um, and there were anti-disability laws where people with major disfigurements were not allowed to be seen in the public. Um, it's sort of shocking to, to understand that that happened in the 20th century, but it was true. And Roosevelt, obviously being a very smart, canny politician, knew that to see to be shown like this, even though this is a, a wonderful photo with a family friend and dog, um, what a wheelchair represented back then was weakness and stigma uh, of a disease. And that wouldn't go to be, you know, the most powerful man, you know, running the most powerful country in the world. So he hid that. And he hit it very well when he had to appear in public or or make a speech. He would have braces locked onto his legs so that he would stand sort of rigidly. He might have a, a cane or a crutch. And he often leaned on his son or a political aide when he had to get around. Um, so next slide. And then we'll we'll go into sort of how they how this um, resolved itself. And it, it really started in the mid uh, 30s. Uh, the gentleman, the second on the left, is a doctor named Donald Monroe. And this is in Boston, Massachusetts area. He was really the first doctor to look at uh, paralyzed men, women, and bring a treatment, a form of treatment to them that would help them get better. And it was a philosophy of sort of 
holistic, so to speak. And it would be dealing with the entire person and also recognizing that each person, each patient, uh, frankly, had different conditions. So if you had a high, if you were power, if your wound or your or what had happened was higher up, it, it would affect different parts of your body. Um, if it, if the wound or something was lower down, again, it would affect different parts of your body. So it was not a one size treat all. And so he would have specialists involved with each patient. So if somebody needed a urologist or maybe a plastic surgeon, physical therapy, that sort of thing. He was really the first to get that implemented. Again, penicillin is just starting out. So he's now able to treat sort of these diseases and infections. So he can see that people are going to live. And I'll draw your attention, the gentleman in the bed, if you look above his head, they're sort of rings. Well, those are for him to grab onto and lift himself up. And that does, of course, a couple of things. It strengthens your arms, you know, shoulders, that sort of neck area. And it's also a, a sort of a keystone with Dr. Monroe, which was he, he, he would tell each patient, I can only do so much. This has got to come from you, too. You've got to want to keep going and, and live. And that becomes a, a central message uh, as the men return from the war and settle in the VA hospitals. And uh, the other thing, the other note to, to say on Dr. Monroe that was um, taken uh, at the VA hospitals was they would have um, special clinics or areas that were just devoted to the care of paraplegics so that they had their own unit. And that was very, very well intentioned to get the, the men, patients, to sort of egg on and help each other. And you could see a new person would come in and he'd see somebody who had been there, let's say a year or two, and was, you know, doing quite well in the wheelchair and, you know, moving around very quickly. It gave them something to aspire to. Um, and it also, of course, kept them away from the general population in the hospital. So you could concentrate on the care. Um, so let's let's go to the next slide. And again, uh, just another doctor to talk about. Uh, this is a gentleman named Ernest Bors. Um, and he becomes the lead doctor uh, in the hospital in the San Fernando Valley at Ben Nuys, Birmingham Hospital, where Stan Dan Adele ended up. And he, he sort of takes Monroe's doctrine, so to speak, and establishes this in the VA hospitals uh, across the nation. And there's, I think, seven or eight of these uh, clinics for uh, paralyzed veterans. Um, he treated them holistically. He encouraged them also, again, with this small clinic to organize and, and help themselves. And the core of that uh, became a group, an organization called the Paralyzed Veterans of America. PVA. They still are around today. They were formed in 1946 out of these VA clinics. They are still around today. They are a powerful and excellent group. Um, and they lobby in Washington, D.C. and have their own publications and have continued to be a force, frankly, through all of the wars, through Korea, through Vietnam, and of course, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and so forth. Um, and they're still around today. Um, one of the interesting things also with, with, with Dr. Bors um, and the VA just in general. Um, so again, we talk about these men coming home from the war. There were about 2,500 of these paralyzed veterans returning to the States. That's a large number. Um, and, and, and think about it if they were to stay in the VA hospital for the rest of their lives, and we're now talking, they may now live a normal lifespan because they've got good medical care. Um, that becomes a huge burden on the taxpayers, on Americans. And so one of the objects of 
getting these men up and going is we want to get them up and going. We want to get them jobs. We want to give them vocational training so that they can be out and they can be paying taxes as well, um, but but that they're not a burden on, on the VA system. So they institute this vocational training. I'll, I'll name, I'll, I'll give you one example, um, which became quite a popular um, uh, job uh, occupation for, for many paralyzed veterans, which was watchmaking um, and watch repair. And, you know, back then, everybody wore watches. Uh, we didn't have our cell phones to look at the clock. And you re- and and we didn't throw out our watches after they stopped running. We we repaired them, and it was a decent job. And the Bulova Company, which was based in New York, uh, had a program, a special program for paralyzed vets, where they would train them in watchmaking and watch repair. And these men went all of, around the nation, having been trained at Bulova. And we'll also mention. Bulova at the time started a wheelchair basketball team. They sponsored the team, um, the watchmakers, of course. Um, so that was one thing. It was let's get you guys going, let's get you exercise, that sort of thing. Um, so the the next slide, please. Um, so here's some rudimentary training exercises. This was something that had never really been attempted before. Um, again, these men are now going to live. Let's get them going. Let's get them stronger. Let's get them so that they can handle the rigors of a wheelchair, which back then weighed a ton. I mean, we're talking those big w- wooden wheelchairs weighed 75, 80 pounds. Um, only after, only during the war did these newfangled ones, which were built, uh, made out of aluminum reduce the weight to let's say 50 60 pounds and the, these were better technology they were better because they could be folded and so you could wheel yourself jump into uh, the car so to speak um, uh, close the wheelchair put it in the back of the car and drive away with an adaptive car and i'll, I'll go into that in a in a moment um, so anyway this was a part of it physical exercise and and obviously, again, young men sweating, feeling good, that, that's only going to help both the body and the mind. And, and, and a lot of this was, of course, um, psychological, like getting over that hump and that fear and uh, how will I fit into this society that frankly is not, you know, there's no ramps back then. Uh, you know, there's no kneeling buses. There's no American with Disabilities Act, ADA. Um, all of that comes later, and it in, in part comes from the work of these men, uh, these pioneers. Uh, next, next slide, please. And th- this will be the, the, the last of the doctors to show you, but a very important figure. He's actually working in uh, England, and he's sort of doing, he's doing, his name is Dr. Ludwig Gutmann. Um, you may have heard of him. He's known as the father of the Paralympics. Um, he was working, doing many of the same things that we were doing over here in America, following the Monroe Doctrine, um, having exclusive clinic or clinics exclusively for paraplegics, um, working with exercise, vocational, all of that sort of thing. And also very much encouraging and maybe even stronger than that, exhorting these men to get up and live, so to speak. Um, So he, and he's an interesting case, like Dr. Bors, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Gutmann was a German Jew who flew, who fled Nazi Germany in the late thirties. He ended up with his family in uh, England and then eventually was chosen to oversee their paraplegic unit in, um, in England at Stoke Mandeville. That's the name of the place. Um, Next, next slide, please. Um, And this is actually a almost historic photo. I mean, this is from, I I believe it's 1948. Um, And you can see Dr. Goodman is standing. He's the second from left. Um, And if you can look closely, you see those old school wheelchairs and they are doing, they're shooting arrows. That's archery. 
So that was the first sport that he brought to to life for the uh, paralyzed veterans. Um, and again, <clears throat> excuse me, it was very much about strengthening chest, shoulders, arms, and being active, and also competition. You know, it's it's fun to compete, right? So this is one of the first uh, photos that we ever that we have of this. It's interesting the if you can again look closely, it's hard to tell. Maybe the first uh, person there shooting the arrow, uh, I believe, is a woman, and he had a few women patients. He was a lot uh, further along in terms of uh, women uh, being active in sports, and we'll see that later on. Um, but so anyway, this is the first one, the first competition, and Dr. Goodman was a very savvy promoter. Self-promoter too, but also a promoter of his precepts about paraplegia and care. Um, he chose this date very deliberately. It was the date of the opening of the 1948 London Olympics, which took place not very far from Stoke Mandeville campus. And Dr. Goodman was very savvy about linking what became the Paralympics with the Olympics. And I'll get into that a little bit later, um, but that was always his dream in the back of his mind. And so it was not a coincidence, I don't think, that he picked that date uh, coinciding with the London Olympics. Um, and just on, as, a, as a sidebar, the London Olympics were the first uh, from after the war, the, the, the World War II had canceled the 1940 Olympics and the 1944 Olympics. So London, while it was still in rubble after all the bombardment from the Germans, uh, was it was the reopening of the Olympics. And so it was very symbolic, not necessarily the greatest athletic competition, because unfortunately, a lot of young men had perished, of course. Uh, but it was this sign of life, like normal life will go on. Um, so ne next slide, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to the States. Um, uh, this is a gentleman named Bob Reinerson. Um, and as uh, Dr. Goodman is known as the father of the Paralympics, um, I, I sort of call Bob Reinerson, in a sense, the father of wheelchair basketball. Um, he was a physical therapist, able-bodied, um, and he was working at the Birmingham Veterans Hospital in Van Nuys, where Stan Danadell is. Um, and he noticed and, and tried to bring sports onto, uh, for the men in the wheelchairs. They tried volleyball, and that was okay, but, you know, sort of limited. Um, they tried baseball, and same thing, very limited because of, you know, a baseball field. How do you, it, it just doesn't work as well you know, with the wheelchairs, which again, were sort of clunky back then. Um, but basketball, basketball seemed doable because of, think about it, the, let's, say, let's say indoor, though they did play outdoor, but think of an indoor court, smooth surface. You can roll the wheelchair quite well. Uh, there's boundaries. It's enough. It's big enough, not small enough. It enables you to go up and down the court pushing your wheelchair. So a lot of, you know, get a sweat going. Um, the one issue, of course, is the, the basket itself, 10 feet, regulation. Uh, what do you do if you're, you know, you're in a wheelchair and I, as part of research for this book, I, I tried to play in a wheelchair. It is very difficult to muscle up a basketball in, uh, to, in a shot. Uh, and they thought about lowering the rim. They thought about moving the court, like where the free throw line is. They thought about moving that further, closer, because it's a, it's a challenge. Um, but the men, and this was somebody, uh, I, I, there was another gentleman who was still alive when I started researching this book. He, his name was Ed Santalanes, a veteran. He said, we didn't, we didn't want to go for that. We thought that would diminish us, and we didn't want that. We wanted the regulation 10-foot uh, basket and backboard and the free throw line where it is. And they made a stand, and frankly, they won. 
and it was a challenge, but they were up for it. Um, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and here, he, that's that's Bob Rainierson as the referee, able-bodied referee. This is one of the first photos ever taken of wheelchair basketball. It's in the gym, Birmingham uh, Hospital gym. This gym actually still exists. I, I visited it. Um, very old school, but uh, still still able, still still works. Um, and you can see those chairs. I, I, I want to point out, besides just the basketball aspect of it, I want to point out those chairs. So in contrast to those old sort of clunky wooden metal chairs, these are the newfangled, they're called, they, they call them E and J's. They're called Everest and Jennings. That's the brand name, E and J's. And one of the designers was an engineer who had suffered paraplegia. And he helped invent this. And you can see they put the big wheels in the back and the little wheels in the front. And it was like night and day. You could move around, you could pivot, you know, you could maneuver almost like you were playing basketball. Okay. And again, that smooth surface, you could really move on these things. And once you, you know, practiced and figured it out, you could really maneuver that. Uh, again, on those chairs, they fold up, they fold it up. And so they were much more convenient, much lighter, and became a huge advantage once competition like this started. So the first games were very, uh, you know, local, Southern California. They would play for the most part because it was hard to find teams, of course. They would play able-bodied teams who would sit in wheelchairs and play in, play with wheelchair play in the wheelchairs against these men and uh frankly of course the men would win cuz they they knew how to maneuver the wheelchairs much better than you know somebody who's able-bodied and just hopping into a chair for the game um so it became sort of a little bit of a local thing um so uh, next slide, please. Um, excuse me while I take a sip here. Um, so they would also practice in the pool there. Um, and the gentleman on the far left underneath the net there, that's Stan Danadel. And so, again, part of this was sort of, it's competition, but it's also fun. It gets you out there, get moving. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, and early in, this would have been, let's see, 47, I guess, 47, early 48. Yeah, the, the men decided, you know what, we're going to go play. We're going to go across the country. And we're going to play the other teams at the VA hospitals all across the country. And we'll set up some uh, exhibitions and that sort of thing. And. They actually defied the president of the United States, Harry S. Truman. Uh, they did not want to let these men, not Truman personally, but his um, his cabinet member in charge of the VA, said, no, we don't want to let these guys do this. They never, they, they didn't know how to handle insurance and that sort of thing. They're like, we can't deal with this. And the men said, you know what, we're going. We're going, we're going on this trip. Uh, I want to point out Stan Denadell is the third from the right in the wheelchair in the front. Uh, you see the one female in the picture, the, the one woman is the nurse. Well, eventually they uh, got married, as a matter of fact. So that <laughs> it turned out to be a great trip for Stan Denadell, I guess. Um, next slide. Um, of course, they didn't really know how to handle. Uh, people in wheelchair at that time and airplanes. So they had to get a lift up to get them into the plane. Um, and that was Jack Heller, another veteran, of course. Um, and ne next slide, please. And yeah, here's, here's, here's one of their first games. And they're playing uh, the Cushing Hospital in Massachusetts, the Clippers. And this became a huge rivalry between these teams. It was it was California, Boston, 
it was, you know, Lakers Celtics before all of that happened. I, you know, to 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 give you a metaphor of sorts. Um, but but really, the competition once these once the teams really got going, the competition was fierce. Um, next next slide, please. Um, and this is from 1948. Uh, gosh, I I'm sorry. I wish I had given you a bigger. Uh, this was right after they played a game in Madison Square Garden um, in New York City. And this is a gentleman named Jack Gerhardt, uh, became a legend in wheelchair basketball, one of the first. Uh, he played with the New Jersey team. And um, I, I believe the award for the best wheelchair basketball player is still called the Jack Gerhardt Award. Um, but that just led, the point being, this is post-World War II. Um, veterans issues are still a major part of, you know, the society. It was a very different world, as, as you probably are well aware. Um, most everybody knew somebody who was who had fought in the war or, or was involved in the war. Neighbor, son, you know, father, that sort of thing. So veterans issues were still very, very important uh, as a news story. And so to see this, to, to see these men playing basketball, wheelchair basketball, and exciting the crowd, it was a huge story. And, and Newsweek puts, puts them on the cover. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, sort of meanwhile, um, <laughs> The other gentlemen that I wrote about were in Corona. Um, the able-bodied gentleman standing on the left side there, Dr. Gerald Gray, he sort of took uh, the, 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 the baton from uh, Corona, I mean, uh, the Van Nuys Hospital, Birmingham, and he devised his own team in Corona Hospital. And that's Jerry Fessenmeyer wearing number one far right. And the star player is uh, Johnny Winterholler, right in the middle, holding the, the basketball next to Gerald Gray, Dr. Gray. So this is this is this team is the Rolling Devils, uh, which is when I heard that name, I it was it was like okay, I have to write a book. I, I, the Rolling Devils, my gosh, uh, what a name! And by the way, the Birmingham team, their name was the Flying Wheels. So same thing, like this is amazing. Um, so these guys were in Corona. Uh, next, next slide, please. <clears throat> they up uh, back one. Yeah, yep. They went up to Oakland. Uh, so the Rolling Devils there on the left. They played the Oakland Bitners, which was a semi-pro team. I mean, the NBA was just starting to get going. Um, it, in fact, hadn't even been formed yet. Uh, but the gentleman on the right for the Bittners, again, they're borrowing wheelchairs. These are able-bodied athletes. That's that's Jim Pollard. He's a Hall of Fame. He's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So these were these were some serious competition. And again, the publicity and and what it brought out was amazing in the community. Um, next slide. Um, I mean, th there's the fans. Just you know just going crazy because they've never seen this before. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> all of the, um, again, all of the press coverage, and this is in every newspaper around the nation, frankly, and columnists and that sort of thing. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, and, and to wrap in what has been going on with the sports, um, on these barnstorming tours, and this is specifically with the flying wheels, and this is the flying wheels, of course, at, at the nation's capital, uh, they would lobby politicians. And this is when I, when I talk about, um, yeah, it's sports, but it's also um, a, a social cause in the sense of they're a unique group. They're, they're paralyzed veterans, and they're going to live. But they need some help. They need some adaptive stuff, equipment to really live a, a full life. And so they would go to D.C. and lobby politicians. It's hard to see, but the, there's a woman standing behind her. That's the senator from Massachusetts, uh, 
Senator Norse, or excuse me, Representative Representative Norse. Um, and she was a, a huge advocate of veterans, uh, specifically the GI Bill. Um, and, you know, these men wanted to go back to school. How do you go back to school at a campus that doesn't have any, you know, uh, ramps or anything for wheelchairs? How do you get to class if your class is on the eighth floor? That type of thing. So they lobbied for specific um, things that would help them live a normal life. Um, and one example, um, and this is again before the Americans with Disability Act, they lobbied for um, funding for them to have adoptive cars, okay, so that they would be able to drive. You put your E and J wheelchair in the back and drive to a job, or drive to the movies, or whatever. Uh, but these are these are a new type of uh, car. They they're hand controlled, of course, as opposed to the legs, but they were able to get that passed. Um, also, um, so they had a car allowance, so to speak. Also, housing, same thing. Okay, we 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 have our wheelchairs. We need a house that's specifically designed for us. Widened doorways, bathroom access, so that you could roll in and pivot and use the toilet or go into the shower without it being a, a major production every day. Um, lowered countertops, garages so you could drive in and then go into the, into the house. These were all things that they fought for and won, legislated, and that's in part why the PBA still exists for, for this specific um, purpose. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, so there's, you know, uh, Harry S. Truman, who was a huge advocate of, um, uh, what was it? Uh, he had, he started a program called National Employ the Physically Handicapped Week uh, and would lobby employers to, to hire uh, people in wheelchairs. Obviously some of the languages now that we use is now different from what they used back then. But Truman was a huge advocate of this. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's the, the flying wheels in the 50s. Um, just skipping ahead for a sec, uh, greeting Dwight Eisenhower. And obviously, before he was president, he was general. Um, he, these were his boys. These were his men. And he wanted to take care of them. Um, you know, veterans' issues were very much on the top of the agenda for presence, and it didn't matter if you were a Democrat or a Republican. Um, these issues were important because it affected pretty much all of us, right? Um, and so all of this, I'm going to call it publicity. Um, of course, when that happens, who comes calling? And we'll see that in the next slide, um, please. Um, of course, it's Hollywood, right? Uh, and this is a shot of Marlon Brando is in the foreground on the ground. He's playing, uh, portraying a gentleman, the gentleman in the wheelchair on the right, uh, Ted Anderson, in a movie called The Men. And those are the director and Zinnemann and uh, screenwriter, Carl Foreman, uh, behind them. Um, and this was a film basically about what these men went through, uh, getting injured, getting paralyzed, and then recovering rehabilitation in a VA hospital. And it was actually shot here in Southern California at Birmingham Hospital. Um, and again, just for trivia, you know, this was Brando's first starring role. Uh, he had been, he had made it big on Broadway and, uh, Everybody and anybody came offering him all sorts of money to do, um, uh, you know, a movie, whatever, be the star. And he chose this one. It was, a, it was sort of offbeat. It's hard to find. You can you can track down the DVD. It's a really super interesting movie, but very dark. And it didn't do so well in the box office, in part um, because it came out right as the Korean War was coming out. So a lot of people didn't want to necessarily go see this type of uh, uh, film, which is understandable. But it's quite a good film. Um, 
quite a period piece. And it's interesting because a lot of the veterans like Ted Anderson and others, Stan Denadel and others are, are it, they're extras in the movie or they're, uh, so it's sort of interesting. They did incorporate some of the uh, paralyzed veterans. Uh, just for a moment, I'm just gonna check my, my time here. Uh, I guess we have a little longer to go and then I will open it up for some questions. Is that, is that okay, Caroline, or are we okay? I don't know, okay. Yes, that, that sounds good, that, that's great. A little bit, a, a little bit longer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll get through, we probably won't get through all of them, but I'll go through the next couple and then we'll, we'll stop. Um, so yeah, that's, um, and I, this is an important slide for, for a number of reasons, but uh, the gentleman, the able-bodied sort of coach there, that's Tim Nugent uh, at University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And Nugent, um, also a veteran, uh, but of course able-bodied, but he was really the first to expand beyond just the paralyzed veterans, okay? So he opens up the sport and wheelchair basketball in particular to people with polio, polio victims, amputees, that sort of thing, non-veterans even, if you just were in an accident or something. Um, and he started that tradition of a, a college team um, and they would play, you know, the, the, the veterans or whatever. But he's really the first um, Nugent. He um, creates the National Wheelchair Basketball League. And um, I know mentioned University of Wisconsin, Whitewater. I mean, that's sort of the where they come from is where they started here in, in Champaign-Urbana with, Ted, with uh, Mr. Nugent, Dr. Nugent, who was also an advocate, by the way, of kneeling buses he, he he basically invented that himself um and also housing accommodation accommodation for people with disabilities um next slide uh, that's uh just a, a a ticket that you could get in 1953 for the national wheelchair basketball tournament and i'll go quickly through um uh just in terms of wheelchair basketball if you can go to the next slide um, this was the this was the game that they event that they played it in England. It's called netball, very different from basketball. You can see there's no backboard. It's a lower rim, that sort of thing. Um, but eventually, and next slide, um, um, eventually the U.S. finally came over to challenge uh, and and participate in Goodman's games at Stoke Mandeville. This is the team that went over. veterans, but paralyzed individuals who were employed by Pan Am and they sponsored a team. Next slide. Um, and they went over and hit, you can see a very violent game against the, the Netherlands. But that was really, Goodman soon abandoned netball in favor of basketball uh, because basketball won out. And so that's how wheelchair basketball came to the fore. Um, Next and next slide. I'll try to get through this. Uh, this is the late '50s. Just to to mention, there were a couple of other sports stars who were paralyzed, going beyond the military. This is, of course, Roy Campanella, Brooklyn Dodgers catcher. And again, that brought out that issue, the issue of paraplegia, to a general public um, in the '50s, after Korean War and before Vietnam. So it sort of kept that image alive. Um, Next, next slide. Um, <clears throat> and then the Paralympics finally succeed as a as an entity um, in first in 1960. Um, Goodman again very consciously follows the Rome Olympics of 60 with the Paralympics in Rome. You can see him. It's, he's a, this is 1964. Four years later, again he has the Paralympics following the Tokyo Olympics. Of 1964, and that's the emperor and and his and the queen or the empress of Japan uh, greeting athletes, and that's Dr. Gutman on the right, far right. Next slide, and we'll get through this. This was uh, the Stoke Mandeville Games again. Dr. Gutman with Queen Elizabeth, of course. There. Um, next slide. 
Um, and I guess I'll, I'll leave it with this. This is from the 1984 Olympics. Um, it's not quite the Paralympics, but they had two exhibition races then. And this is Sharon Hedrick, uh, quite an amazing athlete. Actually, a, another University of Illinois product. Um, and they had two exhibition races, one for men, one for women. You can see those are specialized wheelchairs. And in a sense, this is the legacy, uh, it's, at least in terms of sports, for these paralyzed veterans from World War II. Um, it's sports for people with disabilities of all ages, genders. Um, you have women now participating. Kids can participate. Um, all of these sorts of things come about as a legacy of what happened. And in a sense, it's an accidental legacy, but it's one that has, has you know, proven through the years, it, it, it stood the test of time. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here and, and uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for listening. I, I tend to get going and I, I forget about the time. So I apologize if I went over a little bit, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, does, does anyone have any questions for David? Uh, no. I'll, I'll go. Um, David, how did you how did you get on to this story? Um, why 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 wheelchair basketball? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I'm I'm consider myself sort of an Olympic expert. Um, my previous books, two books before this, um, uh, were focused on Olympics or Olympians. And so I thought I knew pretty much everything about the Olympics. I'm pretty good at trivia and that sort of thing. And it, I came to find out when I sort of first heard about the hospital in Corona being considered one of the birthplaces of wheelchair basketball. I, you know, I went, whoa, I did not know that. And you go down the deep rabbit hole and it just gets more fascinating and fascinating. And uh, once I was connected with uh, Jerry Fessenmeyer, the veteran who I, I showed in the beginning, once I started talking to him, that's when it, that's when it sort of went, okay, this is a book. This is, this is something that needs to be told um because it really hadn't been told up to that point so so yeah that's that's how it came about yeah um other than the veterans that you interviewed where did you get a lot of your source material from uh other than the veterans you interviewed where did you get your source material from oh that's a question goes right to my heart yay i, I love research I, I mean, writing is writing is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. So I love the research. So I went all over. I mean, I went to England to uh, you know the libraries and the references for Dr. Goodman and his papers are in a. It's called the Welcome W E L L Welcome Library, uh, which is a medical research place. Uh, I went to the NIH library in. Um, Bethesda, uh, and I, there I found a lot of great material. Um, the PVA, Paralyzed Veterans of America, they started a newsletter, you know, in 1946, and they would say, oh, game, you know, they'd have the results of all the games, and they'd have interviews with athletes and innovators, and so that was a huge part. Um, and it, it, I'll be honest, and I, I've talked about this before, it took a little while for the people at PBA, um, and in particular, a gentleman named Tom Pierstad, um, who unfortunately recently passed away. But you know, they looked at me a little bit like, okay, who would be here? You're not a veteran, and you're not a paraplegic. So, you know, what the heck are you doing in our territory? And I'll be honest, I, I understood that. that. That's very valid. Um, but once I started to form a relationship and showed them what I had uncovered, because I found stuff that they didn't know about, that's when it became sort of more reciprocal and they were open to showing things, showing papers, that sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, the research was fun. I mean, I went to a lot of libraries and, um, you know, squinted at microfilm and microfiche and, um, and I enjoy that a lot. Okay, well, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, you talked about it a little bit. Were, were movements like this kind of springing up in other countries as well after World War II? Or was America and a little bit England kind of unique in this regard? Um, yeah, I, frankly, they were unique. Um, I mean, it's one of those things. I think for sure Russia was very late to the game in terms of uh, sports with, with disabilities. Um, Germany also, and that may have also been a part of sort of the, you know, let's just say defeatist mentality. Same with Japan. Japan had uh, also a very severe social stigma against disability, sort of like what America had as well way back when. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, it was exclusively America and England. It seeped into Canada, of, of course. But Goodman was what what I again what I admired about him. He, on the one hand, he was a self promoter, but he was also a proselytizer. He would go everywhere and anywhere. He went to Australia, you know. Again, part of sort of the British Empire, but he went to Australia. And he would talk about surgical techniques and he would talk about uh, rehabilitation. So he spread it around in uh, the empire. So Canada, South Africa, um, uh, as, as mentioned, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and then it sort of also seeps into Europe. You have France, Netherlands, Italy, and they're involved with the English part of things. And it's really when America goes over in the late 50s and they start having the competition, that's really when it becomes sort of major league as we know it, like the Paralympics. And that's why most people seem to think that the real opening of Paralympics was 1960 at, at Rome. So, yeah. And I, I was able to interview a couple of the men, not necessarily veterans, but who had participated in 1960 and 1964 at those Paralympics. Is there a professional wheelchair basketball league? Um, I don't know if it's professional, but the, what uh, uh, Dr. Nugent from University of Illinois, that's still going strong, National Wheelchair Basketball League. And of course, now it's sort of international. Um, and it's part of, I guess, FIBA, uh, International Basketball Association. Um, but they also, what they now have are, are levels and, uh, you know, they have a collegiate level and all that sort of thing. I, I believe uh, UW-Whitewater hosted the national tournament in the last year or so. So I, I don't know if it was collegiate or, or what, uh, but it, it's still going strong. Um, uh, it, it's not a pro league, but, but I think they, some of the good teams, you know, are sponsored, I think. Even a couple of the NBA teams, you know, in locally will will sponsor, um, you know, some of the top teams. But I mean, if you go and watch, my gosh, if you go and watch it, the, the skill level is is just incredible. It, it really was impressive to watch highly skilled uh, wheelchair basketball players just going at it. it it's 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 it is a fast action packed, like violent sport. I also know because um, we, we we sent out some some stuff that apparently the the international wheelchair basketball uh, like championship like just happened um, apparently in like in like Abu Dhabi or something like that because they were like oh they're all like really far away <laughs> far away right now playing um, and thankfully now they don't have to. Uh, get uh, taken into the airplane on a lift. They can actually board the plane like we do. So, yeah. OK, um, I think that's it. Uh, can everyone join me again and then thank you. Absolutely fantastic presentation.
Um, if you enjoyed this presentation and uh, want to learn more or like want to learn more about it, first off, we do have um, David's book, Wheels of Courage, uh, for sale in our bookstore. Um, so if you want to learn more about the story, we've got that available. Um, also, if you enjoyed talks like this, um, we've got uh, another talk coming up um, next month. We are going to be having on August 3rd, um, King Neptune's Court, which is uh, about uh, gender expression in the U.S. Navy. That's going to be really exciting. Um, we've got a whole series of really cool talks coming up. So if you enjoyed it, please consider checking out the rest of them. Also, if you enjoyed this program, please consider supporting the museum. Support comes in many different ways, showing up to the programs, telling your friends and family about it, um, donating, or you know, just coming and visiting the museum. All of those things are very much appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you so much to everyone who came out and to everyone who watched. And, and thank you to David for, for bringing us this really awesome story. So yeah, thank you Thanks, so much. Caroline. Thanks to everybody who showed up. Thanks a lot. David. Okay. We'll see you, Caroline. Bye, David. Cool. Thank you. Very good.